When I sit down and meet a young couple who are about to get married, my husband's a rabbi, and when I meet with them, it's usually under, they think it's because I'm gonna explain the wedding ceremony to them. But really, I want to talk about marriage. A rabbi once said, if only people spent as much time planning their marriages as they do their weddings, we'd all be a lot better off. My first session with them is called Scare Them Straight. I don't tell them that, but in my mind, Scare Them Straight. I ask them the following question. Of all the people walking to the chuppah, how many get divorced? Well, what do they say? Half, 50%. And then I ask them, of the 50% who stay married, what percentage would you say have a happy marriage? What would you say? 10%, 5%, whoa, it was higher in Cape Town, yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? 25%, I feel like an auctioneer. Do I hear, does anybody say 50% of the 50%? Okay, would anybody see more than that? 75, sold, okay. In a married audience, I usually get as low as 10 of the 50%, as low as 10 and as high as 50. I once did a Shabbaton with 120 teenagers in Detroit. It was very special, me and 120 teenagers. And I actually was teaching them about the 10 commandments and I got to commandment number seven, which is don't commit adultery. So I said to them, I asked them this question, I threw this out to them. Of all the people walking to the chuppah, how many get divorced? They said, 50%. And I said, of the 50% who stay married, what percentage would you say have a happy marriage? And who are they thinking of? Their parents. You know what they said? 1%, 2%, they weren't joking. And I thought if their parents could be here, they'd be scared straight. So I say to the couple in front of me, let's be very generous, and we're being very generous, and we'll say, of all the people walking to the chuppah, 50% get divorced, and of the 50% who stay married, 50% have a happy marriage. And we're being very generous. That means, of all the people walking to the chuppah, maybe one quarter are gonna come out with a happy marriage. I say to them, you don't wanna be a statistic, now let's learn. The first thing we have to do, and what I share with them, is we have to define our terms. We have to define our terms. The Torah is very big on this. You wanna be happy, what's happy? You wanna be successful, what's success? You must define your terms. One of the tools I use when a couple comes to me and they're having trouble in their marriage, and unfortunately this happens a lot, is I take two pieces of paper and I say to them, you write down your definition of love and marriage and you write down your definition of love and marriage. So the woman writes, love is, marriages, and he does the same thing. Then they hand me their papers. What do I see? Two different definitions. Hello. We're in this together, and yet we define what we're in together differently. How can we possibly achieve anything? At the very minimum, we have to have a mutual definition of what we're in. Now, when I first started speaking about this, I would define love first and then marriage, which sounds like the right order, right? Love, marriage, baby, carriage, right? And then I realized, no, 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 wrong order. Anybody here who's been married for a few years, when you go to a wedding today and the bride and groom get up and they talk about how much they love each other, I love him, I love her, and you're sitting there going, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, they know what love is. They don't know what love is. You can't compare the love I had for my husband on our wedding day to the love I have for him now, 25 years later, five children later, the loss of his father, all the challenges we have, everything we've been through together. That was like a joke on my wedding day. I knew I was onto something, but come on. So we can't, we can't define what love is first, we have to define what marriage is first. The Jewish definition of marriage is very easy to remember. It's one, oneness. That's it, one. It says in Kabbalah, before we're born, we're one soul and God splits us, and your half a soul, you go off into this world, and your other half, your soulmate, also goes off into this world. 
And when God splits you, he do, imagine your soul's like a circle, he does not split you like this. He splits you like this, like two pieces of a puzzle that fit together. And that's why opposites attract. Extroverts tend to marry introverts. People who are organized and detailed tend to marry people who are artsy and flowy. People who like the thermostat up, marry people who like the thermostat down. Why? Because you're half a soul and you're yearning for completion. When you find the right person, you're finding the part of you that was always missing. And the same qualities that we're so drawn to in the other person that complete us are the same qualities that later on in marriage make us nuts. Is anybody here like me, an extroverted woman married to an introverted guy? Anybody like me? Okay, okay. When you're about to walk into a social situation that your husband doesn't want to be at, what does he say to you before you walk in? What does he say? Pardon? Why am I here? Okay, so you know what my husband says? When are we leaving? I go, when are we leaving? We haven't even got in yet. We don't even know if we're having fun and we're already leaving? Yes, for an introvert, being in a social situation is like sucking the air out of the balloon and it, def it deflates them, they get less energy. For an extrovert, being in a social situation is like pumping air into the balloon, you get more energy. Here's the mistake. The same qualities, again, that we are so drawn to in the other person that we need in order to realize our potential are the same qualities in marriage that make us nuts. Why can't you be more social? Why can't you be more organized? Why can't you be more <coughs> fill in the blank? Instead of resenting them, embrace them, celebrate them. Those are the qualities that the Almighty sent to you to help you to become a great person. I hate to break the news to you, but we don't grow through our spouse's good qualities. Our spouse's good qualities are like the whipped cream on the hot chocolate. Yum, 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 extra. Enjoy. Just like we don't grow through our easy kids, we grow through the challenging kids. When we have to deal with our spouse's challenging qualities, what do we have to draw upon within ourselves? We have to be patient and sensitive and supportive and understanding and empathic. If I told you, there's somebody I want you to meet. She, she's so sensitive and understanding and supportive. This is a, a great person. This equals a great person. You thought you were a good person before you got married. And then you got married and your spouse told you, you could be better, all right? <laughs> this is the relationship that is going to squeeze the potential out of you. It's right in your face. Don't make the mistake, again, of not realizing that these challenges, in the, in, and again, everybody's got them. Everybody's got the good stuff and everybody's got the challenging stuff. And it's their challenging qualities that is our road to greatness, if we embrace it properly. My husband is so brilliant and so deep. He's a creative genius. He, he's unbelievable. But you don't get everything. You can't be like that and also be organized and on, on top of every detail. He's like the absent-minded professor. He forgets his car keys, he forgets his passwords, right? He doesn't know the way, understand? Many, many times, many times, when I would come home from a trip, my husband, bless him, would meet me at the airport. And then I'm, ti I'm tired, I've flown across the world, I just wanna go home. And then we go to find the car. And I'm telling you, every time we can't, he can't find the car. Every time, every time. And I'm like, for years, I'm like, again, you can't find the car, right? Like, I'm so tired, I can't, again, you can't find the car? And then I realize after a while, uh-uh, Lori, reframe. Now, when I land, I've already budgeted into my mind that we're going to, for 35 minutes, we're going to have a date. And our date is we're going for a walk to find the car, okay? <laughs> and we catch up on the kids and my trip, but I don't expect him to find the car. It's not who he is. He's an amazing father. He's unbelievably so deep. He's so brilliant. He's such, he has so much wisdom and Torah. Okay, so he can't find the car, all right? Do you understand? You don't get it all. It's how you look at it. 
This is an opportunity for me to be patient. It's an opportunity for me to be understanding, to focus in on his good qualities, which we're going to get to. All right, so marriage is oneness. Under the chuppah, you become one and you live your marriage as one, you would never want to hurt the other person because you really are only hurting yourself. What is love? There are three aspects to the definition of love. Number one, love is the emotion that you feel when you focus in on the virtues of another person and you identify them with those virtues. That's love. I'll repeat. Love is the emotion that you feel when you focus in on the virtues of another person and you identify them with those virtues. You want to love somebody more? Focus in on their virtues. It doesn't mean you're blind to their negative qualities. You see this with children. Is anybody here pregnant? Anybody want to announce they're pregnant? <laughs> Come on, nobody's pregnant in the audience? Come on. Oh, you know, the man puts up his right. Special place here. Okay, all right, Joe Berg, okay. All right, if you ask a pregnant woman, come on, is anybody really pregnant? Seriously. Pardon? You want, if people want it to be a secret? You want it to be a secret? That's over. Okay, okay. If you ask any pregnant woman, oh, you got somebody pregnant over there? Ah, there you got somebody, okay, hi. What's your name, honey? Yeah, your name. Mandy, okay, Mandy, is this your first? You could tell, she's got that, totally has no idea what she's getting into, look. Yeah, you could tell the first, okay? It's great, it's amazing, it's easy, don't worry about it. Okay, okay. It only gets easier, okay, all right. So Mandy, Mandy, you gonna love your baby? How do you know? What, you love every baby? Some baby are, babies are bratty, snotty-nosed kids. Like, you really love every baby? There's babies you don't like. How do you know you're not gonna get one of those? How do you know, Mandy? How do you know? Nobody ever falls out of love with their children. Have you noticed that? Did you, does anybody ever call Jewish Family Services and turn one in? Like, what can I do? I fell out of love. Okay, what can I do? You know why Mandy knows she's gonna love her baby and why all of us know that we're gonna love our babies? No matter how they come out, boy, girl, extrovert, introvert, athletic, creative, easygoing, quick to anger, it doesn't matter. You know why we're gonna love our babies? Because we made a choice, even before this baby is born, that we're gonna love this baby. Love is a choice. Now listen to the insanity. These babies, and we have no idea how they're gonna come out, and we know we're gonna love them no matter what. Our spouses, who we chose, who we compared to other people, and said that's the one, that's the one we fell out of love with? What happened? We stopped choosing. Love is a choice to focus in on their virtues. It doesn't mean you're blind to their negative qualities. Who knows my kids' good qualities better than I do? No one. Who knows my kids' challenging qualities better than I do? No one. But if you ask me about my kids, I'd go, oh, my Shoshana, she's like this, and my Zevi, my Rosh. I'm not just a bragging Jewish mother. That's how I see them, even though I'm completely aware of their challenging qualities. Love is a choice. I can focus in on my spouse's, my husband's good qualities or his challenging qualities. It's my choice. Do you see how empowering that is? It's my choice. That's the first definition of love. The second one, second one is what I heard from David Weiss, who is also speaking in this, uh, in this, um, in Daba. Years ago, we were both speaking in the United Kingdom at a, a huge event. And I heard him, He's the head, he was the head screenwriter of Shrek 2, and he said that he learned from his rabbi, who learned from our rabbi, that one of the definitions of love is, and became the theme of Shrek 2, love is what's important to you is important to me. And if you rent Shrek 2, you'll see that that's the theme. I learned this very much from my parents growing up. Talk about opposites attract. How can I describe my parents to you? My mother is very creative, very adventurous. My mother's idea of a great vacation is backpacking in Nepal on 24 hours notice. She's 79, okay, I'm not joking. She just got back from India, all right? My father's idea of a great vacation is an air-conditioned bus tour of Miami he's been planning for six months. Get it? I'm actually a very interesting combination of my parents. I have a very adventurous side and creative side for my mother and a very practical side for my father. So how did they make it work? 
How can they be married for over 50 years and be happy? Because they lived this. What's important to you is important to me. My mother, she loves the arts. They live in Toronto. They have a subscription to the Toronto Symphony. And every month, my father goes with my mother to the symphony, holds her hand, and tries not to fall asleep. <laughs> my father, he's a real Canadian guy's guy. He likes hockey. My mother goes with him to the Toronto Maple Leaf hockey games, holds his hand, and tries to pretend this is not stupid, okay? Because <laughs> love is what's important to you is important to me. Our middle son, Moshi. Moshi's our jock. Okay, Moshi's totally into sports. He's really into sports. Now, we don't have a television at home, but when I travel, I always turn on ESPN. Why? So I can come home and say, Moshi, I saw Shaq, and his neck is like this. And I saw Kobe and all his tattoos. And I saw the mailman. You know why they call him the mailman? Because he delivers. I know this stuff, okay? <laughs> and when I say this to Moshi, Moshi's eyes light up. Why? He knows I don't love sports, but I love my Moshi. And love is what's important to you is important to me. Third definition of love. Rabbi Dessler asks in his work, Strive for Truth, does loving lead to giving, or does giving lead to loving? I love you, so I give to you, or the more I give to you, the more I love you. And the Jewish answer is, the more you give, the more you love. You see this with children. Now, you'll notice by my snotty nose, bratty um, comment that I'm not really so into babies, all right? I happen to love my own babies, but I wasn't one of those people who grew up and like, was a babysitter and uh, really into babies. So I was a little bit concerned when I started having my own children. Turns out you love your own babies, yay. All right, so I had <laughs> our first baby, Shoshana. I, when they handed me Shoshana in the hospital, I was completely overwhelmed at how helpless babies are. They can't do anything on their own. They can't feed on their own. They can't clean up on their own. They can't roll over on their own. You gotta burp them, okay? They can't even burp on their own. Why did God make it that way? It could have been like the animal kingdom. A deer has a fawn. The fawn nurses a little and goes, has a life. Why did God make it with human beings that they're so helpless? You know why? So we'll give and we'll give and we'll give and we'll give. And what do you get back for the first few months? Oh, you get something back. <laughs> Sleepless nights, throw up down your back, diarrhea down your front. Mandy, don't listen, okay? <laughs> Not your baby. <laughs> and you love this baby more than life itself. You throw yourself in front of a truck for this baby. The more you give, the more you love. You wanna love somebody more? Be a giver. When I was engaged, uh, Rebbitson Fagy Tversky, who's a real Rebbitson, she's the real deal, from Milwaukee, she's from the Tversky dynasty. She has a tremendous marriage, she's a very wise woman, she's somebody to ask wisdom of. She came to Toronto when I was living there and to speak for Aish. If you ever want to spend time with the speaker, ask to drive them to the airport, right? It's like, it's a trick because you can't usually get any time with the speaker. So I said to Aish, I would like to drive Rebs and Tversky to the airport. So they were happy, they didn't have to deal with that, and I got Rebs and Tversky one-on-one. -on -one. So now I'm driving to the airport, it's a short drive in Toronto from the Aish Center to the airport, and I'm telling her my whole life story, you know? So then we get there, and I say to her, I'm taking the, the, the suitcases out of her trunk, and I said, Rebs and Tversky, if you could give me one piece of marital advice, what would you give me? She says, I'm gonna give you the advice that my brother-in-law gave me the night before I got married. She said, you should wake up every morning and the first thing you should think is, what can I give to my spouse today? And I said, oh, okay. She goes, no, no, Laurie. You think it sounds simple. One extra act of giving a day. It could be a small little thing. It will add up to hundreds of thousands of givings in a marriage. And unless, God forbid, you're in an abusive marriage, don't worry about receiving. When you're in giving mode, you create an atmosphere of giving. We become givers. And the more you give, the more you love. So I once gave this assignment. I was living in Denver, Colorado for four years. And I gave this assignment to a group of women I was learning with. I said, okay, so now our assignment is, we're all going to, this week, do one extra act of giving for our husbands, and we're gonna report back next week. 
So the next week we got together and I said, who did their assignment? And one woman goes, I would like to share what happened. I said, sure, because they're Americans, they share, not like South Africans. <laughs> all right, okay, all right. <laughs> so, so she said, I would like to share. She says, it was Wednesday and I had not done my homework yet on that day. And I realized, oh my gosh, it's the evening and I haven't done it yet. So I was making a cup of tea and I said to my husband, honey, I'm making a cup of tea. Would you like a cup of tea too? He's like, yes, I would. The next day she said, he was making a cup of tea. And he said, sweetheart, I'm making a cup of tea. Would you like a cup of tea too? She's like, yes, I would. She says, this works. <laughs> the more you give, the more you love. All right, so now we have our definition of marriage and our three definitions of love. Now we're gonna move on to the most popular part of my dating workshop, which I've given to thousands of people all over the world, is the three questions you have to answer yes to in order to know it's the right person. It's not in any order, because you have to answer yes to all three. It doesn't matter, it's not a priority order. In my dating workshop, so for those of you who are single or advising people who are single, these are the three questions you must answer yes to to know it's the right person. For those of us who are married, if you answer no to one of these questions, do not leave the room and turn to your spouse and say, I knew it all along and Lori just confirmed it, all right? <laughs> Don't do that, they will never invite me back, all right? For those of us who are married, these are the three areas that we have to put a lot of time and effort into in our marriage, got it? Okay, question number one. Do you have the same goals? And I don't mean we both want to get married and move to the suburbs and have a three-car garage and go south once a year and north once a year. I mean meaningful life goals. Not just do we want to have children, what values do we want to give our children? Not just what does our house look like, what does our house feel like? What do we want to contribute to our community, to our people? Somebody came up to me after a dating workshop and she goes, I don't know if the guy I'm dating has the same meaningful life goals as I do, because I don't know what my meaningful life goals are. It starts with you. Until you know who you are and where you're going, you don't know who to go with. My day-to-day -day goals are very different than my husband's. I'm doing a carpool lift scheme, I'm doing a lift scheme, I'm, I'm meeting somebody for coffee, I'm counseling somebody, I'm finishing a chapter for my publisher, I'm doing another lift scheme. My husband's a rabbi, he's being a rabbi all day. He marries people, he buries people, all right? But our day-to-day -day goals together, that we want to contribute something to the Jewish people, we may do it in different ways. This is not just a nice thing for the Jewish people, this is good for our marriage, do you understand? When I was dating to get married, again, until you know who you are and where you're going, you don't know who to go with. For me, because I'm extremely idealistic, for me, when I first started dating, I was like, doctors, lawyers, accountants, I realized I can't marry one of these guys. For me, for some people, being married to an accountant is the perfect thing for them. But for me, no. If I married an accountant, what would I say to him at the end of the day? So honey, everything add up? <laughs> okay. Because of who I am, and because even many years ago I was driven to do something for the Jewish people, I needed somebody who didn't just say, that's nice, dear. I needed somebody who was, who was with me, who was a partner in this. All right. So number one, do you have the same goals, meaningful life goals? Number two, are you physically attracted to each other? The Talmud said this is a very, 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 very important part of a marriage. And not just for the first years until the kids come and then blah, blah, blah. This is actually supposed to be getting stronger in a marriage and not weaker. In the Torah, when it says that a husband is intimate with his wife, it says, and he knew her. The more knowledge, the more love. The more love, the more desire for each other. But men and women often look upon this area differently. Now, I'm going to generalize right now. What does generalize mean? There are exceptions, all right? But in general, for a woman, Attraction to the man is very much inside out. And for a man, it's the opposite. It's very much outside in, in general, general. Imagine, imagine you're single. Girls, I'm talking to ladies now, okay, girls? You're single, and you're standing at a party with a friend, and you see a guy cross the room, 
and he's hot, which is a very regional term, I have to tell you. I speak all over the world. If I say hot in London, they're turning up the air conditioning, okay? <laughs> in London, he's fit. In Costa Rica, he's wapo. In Brazil, he's a cat. I once spoke to a deaf audience, he's this. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but you say, I found that you say hot here, right? He's hot, okay. So you look at, and your friend sees you looking at him, and she goes, he's hot, isn't he? And you're like, oh my gosh, he's so hot. And she says, he's my cousin, do you want to meet him? Totally, like, of course I want to meet him. So now you're going across the room with her, and you're like, okay, no, I can't do it, I can't do it. Okay, 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 oh, okay, oh, okay, okay, okay. And then you get across the room, your heart's beating out of your chest, you have no saliva in your mouth. She introduces you to the guy, and she slips away. Now you're talking to the guy. A few minutes in, you realize, porch lights on, nobody's home, okay? <laughs> Somebody said, body by Nautilus, brains by Fisher Price, okay? <laughs> for a woman, in general, you're not even physically attracted to him anymore. It's different for a guy. He sees a girl across the room, she's hot, there's nothing, he still wants to be with her, all right? <laughs> it's true, it's true. In marriage, it's also the same in marriage. For a woman, how he treats us outside the bedroom is directly related to how we will treat him inside the bedroom. And for a man, it's the opposite. How she treats him inside the bedroom is directly related to how he treats her outside the bedroom. Do you hear the problem? Okay, somebody has to make the first move here, and don't wait for it to be the other person. So for a woman, if he's supportive and understanding and a great father and considered outside the bedroom, that directly relates to how she will treat him inside the bedroom. I'm gonna give you an example of how romance can change in a marriage as years go on. There's still romance, but it changes. I'm gonna give you an example that you're not gonna be able to relate to, because you live in South Africa. It's about housekeeping, okay? So just imagine, okay? Imagine a life without maids. I have to tell you, <laughs> Rabbi Chaim Willis, he is the head of Aisha Torah here in Johannesburg. He is my husband's best friend. He brought my husband into Aish. My husband became religious through Rabbi Willis. My, Rabbi Willis made our shidduch. He introduced, I met Rabbi Willis, he introduced me to my husband. He changed our life. We have tremendous gratitude to him. And whenever he asks us to do anything, even if it's flying across the world and speaking nonstop morning, noon, and night, we always say yes except when he asked us to move to South Africa. About 13 years ago, they made a big push that we should move to South Africa. And it was a big, big push. And in the end, we decided it was just way, way, way too far away from our elderly parents. And we said no, and it was hard to say no to Rabbi Willis. But one of their pitches was, Lori, you'll never do laundry again. <laughs> and I was like, that doesn't matter to me. Can I tell you, 13 years later, every time I do laundry, I think I'll never do laundry again. Okay. <laughs> But I'm fine with that, okay, fine. All right, so I'm one of those people, I don't mind doing laundry, I really don't mind it, I don't like putting it away. I don't mind shopping for groceries, I don't like putting them away. I don't mind loading a dishwasher, I hate unloading dishwashers. It's just the way I am. One night, when our children were little, my husband went to bed, my kids are asleep, and I don't like to wake up to a messy kitchen. So I decided, I'm gonna clean up the kitchen. Now I have to unload the dishwasher. And I hate unloading dishwashers. I opened the dishwasher, and it was empty. Now, we didn't have help, my kids are little. Who unloaded the dishwasher without me asking? My husband. I have to tell you, I got this wave of romance from my husband at that moment. I was like, this is sick, an empty dishwasher, okay? Yes. <laughs> I gave this talk in Minnesota, and it was a marriage talk, and we were all in a room, and there were like round tables with wine and candles, and there was probably like 50 couples. And I gave this marriage talk, and I gave this example. And the next morning, I met with the women of the community, and they told me that the night before, when they went home, their husbands ran to the dishwashers, okay? Look, honey, look, 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 okay. Robertson Weinberg came to Toronto many years ago when we were living there. And 
she met with the Aisha Tor Rebbitsons, and she was very, very strong about how important it is to keep this part of our marriage strong, and this doesn't just happen, you must put effort into it. And she says, one of the mistakes we make is that when we go out, ladies, how do we, how do we dress when we go out? We dress great, we're up, right? We dress up, you look beautiful, right? You dress up, and then we go home, and what do we do? We dress down, okay? You put on your sweats, whatever, right? Listen. Our husbands are out there all day long interacting with women who went out and they look marvelous. And then he comes home to us. <laughs> Now, it's not like he's going to walk in and you're in your sweats and he's going to call up the based in for a get, okay? <laughs> But this is chip, 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 chip away at the fragile Ming vase called our marriages. And enough chips will cause a crack and enough cracks will cause a break. She told us that every night when her husband, Rabbi Yaakov Weinberg, with blessed memory, when he would drive up into the driveway, she would run to the bathroom, put on fresh lipstick, spray perfume, fix her hair, and go to the door to greet her husband. And night after night, their kids saw. Their father would drive up to the driveway, she would run to the, she would run to the, the mirror, lipstick, perfume, hair, and go to the door to greet their father. One night, she said she was very tired, and she fell asleep on the couch and her husband drove up in the driveway, and the kids panicked. Tati's home, and mommy's asleep on the couch. She says, you woke up, and they were smearing lipstick on her mouth, <laughs> spraying perfume, whenever you. <laughs> It's a funny story, but listen to the message. Their kids saw, night after night, that their mother cared more, but their father thought of her than anyone else in the world. The Torah also has a system that is almost a guarantee to keep this strong. It's the system of Taharata Mishbacha, Laws of Family Purity, Mikvah, which is basically an on-again, off-again system in terms of intimacy. I've had more than one friend who was having trouble in the bedroom and went to a therapist who specializes in this. And I was curious, and I asked them, what did the therapist say? And they told me the same thing. They say the first thing if you go to a therapist who specializes in this is they will tell you abstinence. And slowly, 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 they bring you back together. God does this every month. And the Talmud says to a man, keep the laws of mikvah so that your wife will be like a bride to you every month, that you'll have the desire for her every month like you had on the wedding night. This is also proof, and I know Rabbi Kellerman has a much more intellectual and scientific and rational approach to the div divinity of the Torah, but for me, this is proof that God wrote the Torah and man didn't, because man would never write this in, okay? <laughs> See your local rabbi in Rabbitson for more information on this incredible, beautiful, amazing mitzvah. All right, third question. Third question is different for a man than for a woman. For a woman, she comes to me, is this the one? Is this the one? Is the most important decision you'll ever make in this world? Is this the one? So first, first question, goals, yes. Physical attraction, yes. And then without him in the room, I look her in the eye and I ask her, do you respect him? And she answers yes immediately, without hesitating, then this is it. But if I say, do you respect him? And she goes, yeah, I worry. Or if I say, do you respect him? And she says, yes, but she looks away when she answers. I also worry. A woman came to me in Denver, is this the one that was one? Yes, 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 do you respect him? She goes, yes, and she glanced away when she answered. Now, I don't have my doctorate in behavioral science, but if I ask you a question and you look away when you answer, you're lying. So I probed and there was something about him she did not respect. She married him anyway, and then she divorced him. It is a very, 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 very big deal for a man that his wife respects him. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> I have my theories, ego, society, it doesn't matter why, it just is. He can be the CEO of a corporation and people are bowing down to him all day long, but if he comes home and his wife doesn't respect him, it's not good. Ladies, I'm going to give you Respect 101 now. This is basic, basic, basic respecting your guys. If, if you're not doing this, don't even come to me, I don't want to talk to you. Basic respecting your guy. Imagine Oprah Winfrey has chosen you for an in-camera interview in your house. And now's the day that Oprah and the camera crew are coming. How do you look? You look great. How does your house look? Great, okay. So now you're talking to your friend waiting for Oprah and the camera crew. 
ding dong. Oh my gosh, Oprah's here, I'll call you back. Oprah, Oprah, this is the most exciting day of my life. This is great, what can I get you, this is great. Oprah ain't coming, regular day. You're on the phone with your friend. Your husband walks in. When your husband comes home, get off the phone. And he should hear you say, oh my gosh, my husband's home, I gotta go, click. What message are you sending to your husband? You are more important than anyone else on the end of this line. And it's true, there are two exceptions. Number one, it's his mother. <laughs> then you go, it's your mother, and you hand him the phone. <laughs> Number two, it's an emergency. People don't realize that rabbis and rebbitsons also have lives. And I remember that I was living in Denver, Colorado, and I had a week that was. It was one of those weeks where everything hit the fan. Shabbos morning, somebody comes over to me during Kiddush and says, Lori, I called you three times this week and you didn't return even one of my calls. I go, my dear, I had one of those weeks that unless you left me a message, my husband's having an affair or I'm converting to Catholicism, I'm not calling you back, okay? So the next time, she left me this message. She left me this message, hi, Lori, it's so-and-so, off to mass, call me, okay? <laughs> That's an emergency. Otherwise, get off the phone. And sometimes, we're not on the phone. And you hear your husband, guys don't listen to this, you hear your husband drive up, you pick up the phone, oh my gosh, my husband's, even when they know you're lying, they love it, okay? <laughs> I travel back city to city, and husbands have told me that this is the number one thing that improved their marriage. Such a small thing. What's the question, because what does a man need? A man needs to be respected. What does a woman need? A woman needs to be loved. A man wants to be loved, but needs to be respected. And a woman wants to be respected, but needs to be loved. So what do we ask the guy, without the girl in the room? We ask him, will you be happy making her happy for the rest of your life? Every man needs a job. A man's job in marriage is to make his wife happy. But ladies, you have to give him a break. You didn't marry a mind reader. You have to help him to understand what makes you happy in a way that builds him and doesn't diminish him. True story. My husband and I met 25 years ago in Israel at the beginning of January. Got engaged at the end of January, got married in June, and now it's October and it's, our, it's my birthday, okay? My husband remembered it's my birthday, you gotta give him that, and he hands me my present. I open it up, what did my husband give me for the first birthday we're celebrating as husband and wife. A food processor. <laughs> the men are like, that's a good idea, food processor. Okay, no. No, a food processor for my birthday? I was devastated. But he must have heard me say, as we were setting up house after all the shower gifts and, and the wedding presents, I don't have a food processor. I need a food processor. So my husband's a man. She needs a food processor, right? <laughs> But that's not what you get your wife for her birthday. I realize, he's all smiles, I realize he has no idea he blew this. So I said, thank you, honey. I needed a food processor. And I waited for him to leave the room, and I called up my friend Esther. I go, Esther, Yaakov just gave me my birthday present. She goes, what'd you get, what'd you get? I said, a food processor. She goes, oh, you poor thing, I'll take care of it. So she told her husband to fry him. They'd been married a year before us. He worked my, with my husband, Yaakov, at Aish. He waited a couple of weeks and mentioned in passing that women like perfume and jewelry for a present. Perfume and jewelry, okay? <laughs> so the next time we had something to celebrate, he got me perfume. And the next time he got me Perfume, and the next time you come here, I go, honey, we just use a tiny little bit, okay? Then we go into jewelry, and there's no turning back, okay? We're good to go, we're good to go. <laughs> Again, you want to, well, I asked my Rebbitson, what's my job as a wife besides the obvious? She says, your job is to take a good guy and make him great. I go, how do I do that? She goes, by pointing out his mistakes in the very best way possible. And most of the time, it's not by telling him you're making a mistake. They can take that as criticism, and this is not good for them. So you go around, be smart, ladies. Be smart. All right. <sighs> We're out of time, so I'm gonna fast forward. Fast forward. This is not my talk on soul in the afterlife, but at the end of soul in the afterlife, we talk about who do you spend eternity with? I asked my rabbi, Rabbi Noach Weinberg of Blessed Memory, he says, you, you have a connection to your parents in a certain relationship with them, 
and you have a connection to your children in a certain relationship with them. But the person you really spend eternity with is your spouse. Now, some people look happy, <laughs> and some people, okay. And I told this to my friend Sandy when I first learned this in Toronto, and she has a very good marriage, but she goes, my kids are not with my kids. I go, Sandy, it makes so much sense to me. You give and you give and you give to your children, and you're a success as a parent if they do what? They grow up and leave you. If they're 35 and living in your basement, something went wrong, okay? But you give and you give and you give to your spouse only so that they'll come close to you. If you grew apart, something went wrong. What is this teaching us? Choose wisely and work like crazy at your marriage. What you put into your marriage in this world is what you will reap for eternity. Thank you very much.